Hi, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard Schwartz at uh, Rice University. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, once again. My name is Richard Schwartz. I'm with the Department of Bioengineering at Rice. Yesterday I talked about uh, optical diagnostic systems for pre-cancer. And uh, today I'm going to talk about something completely different, uh, which is a global health technology initiative that we have at Rice University called Rice 360. And uh, whereas yesterday I talked about research that I am deeply involved in personally, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a variety of different things being done by many different people, so hopefully I will be able to accurately describe them. Uh, so RICE 360 is a program that was founded uh, in 2007 by Dr. Rebecca Richards Cordham at RICE. And in the six years since then, it has grown into a program with collaborators in over 20 countries around the world, uh, shown on the map here. And uh, our worldwide partners include uh, clinical collaborators, research collaborators, uh, locations where uh, students go on internships, uh, where s we have exchanges with faculty and students from other institutions, and in some cases, policymakers as well. Uh, funding for the program uh, comes from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, particularly for the educational component, and also from uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, particularly for some of the implementation parts, as well as some funding from private foundations as well. Um, I'm happy to say that Brazil is on the uh, list of collaborators. Uh, in addition to the collaborations that we have with uh, Dr. Bagnato and Dr. Karachi, uh, we also had a couple of student interns who spent last summer at uh, Barretos, just up the road from us here, uh, at the cancer hospital. And uh, their names were uh, Jessica and Yian, and they spent eight weeks there uh, working with the I believe they were working with the mobile prevention team that goes out to different uh, towns uh, and provides preventive services. So I, I don't know, it's possible that there may be people here who happened to encounter them last summer. Does anybody happen to run into those students uh, last summer when they were here? Okay. So uh, anyway, we have uh, uh, collaborators all, all around the world at this point. And the motivation for RICE 360 is, is really summarized uh, by this slide. Uh, in just one year, in 2011, nearly 7 million children under the age of 5 died worldwide. And more than half of those deaths are due to conditions that could be uh, prevented or treated with very basic affordable interventions. And so RICE 360 is focused on uh, point-of-care diagnostics for uh, global health applications with a particular emphasis on maternal and neonatal health. So uh, the program was founded with three primary goals or components. The first component is uh, innovation, uh, which is to design effective and uh, low-cost health technologies that address critical health needs. The second component is education, to prepare students uh, to be leaders in tomorrow's global uh, health technology workforce. And the third component is implementation, to increase access to appropriate health technologies in low resource settings. So I'll talk about each of these components uh, in turn, and I'll start with innovation. So there was a paper that uh, was published in Nature in 2006 that uh, examined the potential effect of a number of different uh, point of care diagnostic tests if such tests could be developed uh, on, on health worldwide. And uh, the paper went into, you know, they used different models of using certain sensitivity and specificity values, which you remember we discussed yesterday, uh, and assumed certain levels of treatment were available or not available. Uh, so you can go to the paper for all the details. But basically, uh, for example, they found that a test for bacterial lower respiratory infection, uh, particularly to distinguish bacterial causes from viral causes, 
uh, with just 95% sensitivity and 85% specificity, could save over 400,000 lives per year with a little bit greater access to therapy. Uh, in uh, tuberculosis, a rapid diagnostic test for active TB infections with 85% sensitivity and 97% specificity could similarly save over 400,000 lives annually. And it goes on with tests for uh, HIV AIDS in infants and diarrheal diseases and so on. And the point of the article is that you don't need a perfect test and you don't really need a test that can be applied in the complete absence of any if infrastructure uh, that you can get a pretty good start and save a lot of lives with a test that is reasonably good and that can be applied in a setting with minimal infrastructure. And so, uh, and you can see here that, you know, the, the, the quantities of, of lives saved and years of life saved are quite staggering, especially, uh, you know, depending here on whether there's, in the case of HIV AIDS, with very limited access to antiretroviral uh, therapy or uh, or fuller access to it. So at Rice, uh, our department has strengths in nanotechnology, optical imaging, and uh, microfabrication. And so uh, what we're doing is we're trying to apply those strengths to develop point-of-care diagnostics in which we have a, a, a sample from the patient at the point of care that may be blood or saliva or a stool sample or whatever, and that is uh, that sample is placed in a, a microcuvette or a slide or whatever, and we do some type of automated rapid analysis that typically involves some con targeted contrast agent, some imaging or spectroscopic method to read it out, and then that we produce, uh, uh, we process the data and it produces a quantitative diagnostic output right at the point of care in a short period of time. Uh, so that it can be acted upon by the, uh, by the healthcare worker. One example of this is CD4 counting for patients with HIV AIDS. Uh, these patients have to be monitored over the course of years, uh, and if their CD4 counts drop below a particular level, it indicates the need for antiretroviral drugs. And so this can be done using flow cytometry, but uh, flow cytometers cost many tens of thousands of dollars and so are uh, often not available in low-resource settings. So uh, one member of our department, Dr. John McDevitt, has developed a device to do uh, lab-on-a-chip CD4 counts. Uh, this is a variation of a type of device that he had previously developed called an electronic taste chip that basically integrates uh, microfluidic platforms and uh, miniaturized uh, optical readouts and uh, targeted contrast agents in a small uh, chip-based device. And so in this particular variation, that uses whole blood as an input. Uh, white blood cells are captured on a filter. The red blood cells are passed through the holes in the filter. Uh, the white blood cells are labeled with an anti-CD4 antibody and imaged and analyzed. And these images show some results of field testing in Botswana. It's a, it's a, it's a double labeling uh, configuration where there's uh, a green label and there's a red label and then the, the ones that we want to count are the ones that uh, when you do the overlay they appear yellow. And so this represents uh, a high CD4 count, a low CD4 count here. And uh, you can see the uh, nice agreement here between the lab on a chip system and the, uh, the commercial flow cytometer here. And the idea is that you can do uh, a rapid test, as I said, using whole blood uh, in something like 15 or 20 minutes at about one-fifth of the cost of conventional flow cytometry in this case. Uh, another member of our uh, department, Dr. Uh, Tomas Tkacic, uh, builds miniature optics and miniature microscopes. And this is an example of one of his uh, miniature microscopes here. You see the illumination fiber at this end, uh, some lenses down here, beam splitter, the camera would go out here, and we have a grading actuator for doing structured illumination and so on. Uh, this is sitting on a US one cent coin. Uh, I say it's relatively small. I think you're going to see even smaller microscopes in uh, later presentation this afternoon. Uh, and uh, the, uh, 
Dr. Kachik also builds uh, miniature microscope objectives. This is a multi-element objective design here uh, that's built into housing that's, uh, say, three to four millimeters in size. Uh, the alignment is done with these very nice self-centering mounts, which is kind of, kind of an interesting way to do it. And the applications of something like this would be microscopy for detection of various infectious diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, and various pathogens that cause uh, diarrhea, including things like cryptosporidium and giardia and so on. Uh, this is just an example uh, showing a comparison of the, uh, the imaging performance of the miniature objectives compared to a commercial Zeiss objectives. These are cryptosporidium oocysts here, and these are uh, some stained blood smears with, the, with plasmodium, the malaria parasite. The idea of this miniaturization is to try to build these optical sensing components into a, an integrated readout and signal transduction uh, configuration. Uh, so this represents a palm size universal fixture with a, a microfluidic platform as the basis where the, where the sample is placed and where you have your various uh, contrast agents and assay and so on. And then you have plug and sense optical interrogation units that can do different types of measurements, including things like light scattering and fluorescence and spectrophotometry as well. And uh, these are, this is one of the assembled prototypes of this universal fixture, and I understand that they're making, this is the initial version, and they're trying to get it smaller and smaller as they go. Um, not all of the devices that we are working with involve complex optical elements. Uh, this is a paper and plastic device for recombinase polymerase amplification of HIV DNA. Uh, this is important because uh, rapid antibody tests for HIV that work in adult populations don't work so well in infants because there may be uh, maternal antibodies present uh, that can give you false positive results. And so uh, this is a method to amplify the HIV DNA uh, that doesn't require thermal cycling. The, the, the gold standard for uh, diagnosis in infants would be PCR, uh, but that requires some infrastructure and some thermal cycling. This is an isothermal process, and so it involves uh, dipping the wick into the sample, folding the device, this paper and plastic device, and in about 15 minutes it amplifies a small number of copies of HIV DNA to detectable levels, so it can be part of a point of care uh, diagnostic device. Similarly, uh, this is a lateral flow assay to detect cryptosporidium oocysts, and it's based on the same concept of uh, uh, the, the RPA, once again, which is an isothermal process, which makes it much easier to implement in these low resource settings. Uh, and in this case, the DNA would be extracted from a uh, processed stool sample. Now, Yesterday, I talked extensively about precancer diagnostics, and I'm not going to talk about it again today, but I'll just mention that in many countries, uh, deaths due to infectious diseases are gradually, uh, fortunately, beginning to decrease, and so we begin to get a little bit more of an aging population, and so cancer uh, is becoming more and more of a problem in many countries around the world. And when I discussed the uh, pre-cancer uh, diagnostic de devices yesterday, I talked about things that were useful uh, in the clinical environment where you had to have something that's compact and portable and fast and simple and robust. And all of those adjectives basically describe things that would be very useful in a point of care setting in, in a low resource situation. And so we're taking a lot of these pre-cancer diagnostic technologies and trying to apply them in these settings. And so you see a, a study of autofluorescence imaging going on in India here. And uh, I talked quite a while yesterday about the, uh, the high-resolution microendoscope device. So this is a version of that same device that is built into a uh, commercial digital camera uh, instead of uh, requiring a laptop computer. So we're trying to apply many of these same technologies uh, in these settings. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about edu the education component. 
The education component of Rice 360 is called Beyond Traditional Borders. It was actually created a couple of years before the Rice 360 program. Its uh, original funding was from HHMI. And uh, the program is, uh, it's, an, it's an undergraduate education program. And it's a multidisciplinary program that trains students to understand, address, and solve global health disparities and problems. And the components include uh, coursework and a lot of uh, project-based instruction and internships that are done typically over, over the summer months. RICE ha now has a global health technologies minor. Uh, the coursework for the minor is shown here. Students start out taking an introductory bioengineering course, then a design course in global health. Uh, then they have uh, a choice among several courses here in metabolic engineering, ergonomics, and sociology, and so on. And then they take a, a, a two uh, senior design courses in global health uh, challenges. And these are kind of the capstone courses in the program. And these three boxes here, uh, this one, this one, and this one, all include significant engineering design projects. So that by the time they're getting uh, up to this level, they've had quite a bit of experience in trying to do uh, designs for these applications. And then there are also various electives that they choose from, and I've just shown a few examples of the many, the many electives that are, that are available on the list. So uh, to date, we've had uh, 71 global health technology minors. We've had 84 internships completed so far. And uh, kind of a remarkable statistic, if you include everybody that has participated in a course or a, a, a minor or an internship or in some form participated in some sort of BTB-sponsored competition, that is actually up to about 10% of the Rice undergraduate uh, student body. So I'm going to show a number of student designs. Uh, these are designs that come out of the different courses where the, the students have a, a particular design challenge uh, a certain very limited budget and set of materials to work with, and they're asked to come up with some type of solution. Many of these projects have developed over the course of uh, a couple of different semesters, perhaps a couple of different design teams have worked on these in succession. So this is a low-cost microscope that was developed by a student group uh, for uh, uh, sputum microscopy. And uh, it's battery powered, it uses an LED flashlight and an iPhone as the detector. And I believe that this microscope is uh, one of the instruments that was brought by, uh, by the, the students who were uh, in Brazil last summer uh, to kind of show it around and get, get people's input on it. Um, this is a student designed hemoglobinometer uh, for rapid assessment of hemoglobin concentration and the blood sample is just spotted onto filter paper and then it, there's an optical measurement and a readout. Uh, this is a student designed syringe clip and this is kind of an interesting application. Uh, the idea is that in situations where, uh, where someone has to, uh, has to provide a liquid medication, say antiretroviral drugs, uh, the, there's, it's important to get, make sure that you get the accurate dose, and you know, that's true anywhere. And in particular, there can be difficulties in some of the low resource settings uh, in getting accurate doses. And so these students came up with this, uh, these color-coded syringe clips that are inserted into the syringe and lock in place, and they provide a physical stop so that the, the correct dose is, is obtained. And they're color-coded for different doses, so you can say, you know, use the red one for this dose and so on. And uh, they took, the students took data, and they, they used, uh, I think they used Pepto-Bismol or something like that as their, their test uh, for, for this. And they, uh, they the, the data are from uh, participants both in, in Houston in the U.S. and also in, uh, in uh, I believe, in Botswana. Uh, in, 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 in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And so the, uh, you can see here from the data that this is the intended dose in this case, 2.5 milliliters, and this is the dosing cup uh, result. You can see the dosing cup is really terrible. Uh, this is the syringe without the clip, and then the syringe with the clip does quite a better job of getting the accurate dose. This is a student-designed neonatal syringe pump 
uh, that doesn't require electricity. It's based on a metronome, so you wind it up and it, uh, there's a mass here attached that uh, gradually moves downward and pushes on the, is in contact with the syringe and it delivers IV fluid at flow rates uh, with shown here with 5% accuracy. Uh, it's quite a, quite a nice little device. It's, uh, it's quite loud, uh, you find when you start it up. Uh, this is, there, there have been a number of different student designs that have been all sorts of clever little ways to do uh, uh, low-cost centrifuges, varying from things like salad spinners where you sit and you pump on it to Dremel tools and things like that. So there have been quite a variety of, uh, of different centrifuges and they're always, uh, you have data comparing the performance of this, the hand-powered centrifuge to the, the uh, commercial centrifuge and so on. So it's quite, quite an interesting set of designs that they come up with. Uh, this is a diagnostic lab in a backpack uh, that basically take it, takes a lot of pretty basic uh, clinical equipment and packs it all into one place. And one of the nice things about it, it has all these things in it, microscope and centrifuge and oximeter and so on. Uh, one of the nice things about it is that the uh, battery can be charged via a solar panel or you can plug it in. and so. Uh, this is kind of a handy thing for people to be able to take out into the field. Now, um, we are uh, very pleased that, the, uh, the, that this program, the uh, Appropriate Design for Global Health program, uh, won the Science Prize for Inquiry-Based Instruction recently. And uh, it's interesting, one of the, uh, in, in the, the article uh, written by Dr. Cordham, uh, on this, she uses the quote here. Uh, it's a, a quote uh, from Haiti that says, you don't learn to swim in the library, you learn to swim in the river. And that is the philosophy that is used in uh, trying to put these students into a situation where they have to learn how to uh, design equipment for these, these applications. Now, before I talk about implementation, I want to give you a little bit of context here. Um, there has been a very rapid expansion of interest in global health uh, in the United States and in many other countries as well, I believe. And so this uh, paper here goes through some of the, uh, some of the background on this. Uh, in the United States, in the uh, at University of California, San Francisco back uh, in 1999, there was an Institute of, for Global Health established and within 10 years, there were over 50 global health institutes all across the United States. And by now, I don't even, I can't imagine how many there are at this point. And so the paper identifies a number of different challenges involved in developing and operating programs of this type, including establishing the validity and sustainability of global health as a field, uh, career paths, making it a global field geographically, uh, ways to measure success and maintaining momentum uh, for, for these programs over time. And I, I put, it's a lot of text here, but I, kind of, I just kind of like the, uh, the way they put this. Uh, globalization is, has opened access to a lot of different parts of the world. It's captured the imagination of a growing generation of, of, of health professionals and students who are motivated to make a difference. And there's been an unprecedented growth in academic global health programs and the question is how do we manage this growth, growth, this growth effectively in order to uh, effectively and sustainably reduce the global burden of disease which is the whole point. And they have a number of different recommendations and conclusions but I'll just list a couple of them. One of them is that these training programs should be evaluated by the quality of the experience for trainees from all settings and by the incremental improvement in care and infrastructure and research. And also that career development is paramount for those on either side of a partnership. And when you look at the, the, the literature on this and people who have been working in this field for a while, again and again the same things keep coming up. Sustainability, how to keep things going over a long period of time because one-time interventions don't work. You go in and you try something for a little while and then you leave and it just doesn't work. You have to have a sustainable program. And also the importance of two-way exchange, that you have genuine collaborations that keeps coming up. 
Uh, one cautionary viewpoint here is from this paper. Um, in the name of global health trends in academic institutions. And the authors point out that uh, there's a danger that all this new energy for global health will result in it becoming an activity developed without the key ingredients of mutually agree agreed collaborative behavior. And I think this is a real issue. Uh, there are, it, it's very possible to develop programs that really lose track of the need for a two-way collaboration and a genuine ex exchange of ideas. And so the authors suggest that the primary place for these programs is at the undergraduate level and that they can develop leaders who can address these priorities wherever they are based. So now I'll talk a little bit about implementation. Um, one of the early, uh, one of the earliest uh, student developed, well, I'll talk about some of the, these challenges first. Uh, the uh, first challenge was really building a network of collaborators. And uh, this really took quite, quite some time. I think it's, it's developed, as you see, if you saw at the map at the beginning, it's developed pretty well. But the first few years were, were a challenge. And it really, we started by working with our contacts uh, in organizations that were operating in many different parts of the world already. And I'll just mention one of those organizations is the uh, Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative, uh, which is based in Houston, uh, just across the street from us. And I, I just want to mention that it's one of the most remarkable organizations around. Uh, they do incredible work. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to have some contacts that uh, introduced us to collaborators that we're now working with in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So once again, if you want to look that up, it's a very great, it's a great organization, the Baylor International uh, Pediatric AIDS Initiative. Um, and it involves uh, keeping these collaborations going requires a lot of uh, investment of time and a lot of travel. Uh, Dr. Cordham and Dr. Odin uh, do a, a spend a lot of time traveling to all these different collaborative sites working with people, all of, all of the ideas for the projects basically come from clinicians at the collaborating sites. Uh, we, we don't really come up with the ideas uh, for, for student projects and design, design projects and so on at Rice. We, we get input from the uh, clinicians at the places where these would need to be implemented and try to figure out how to address those. Um, Building, and here, here are these, these ideas again, sustainable long-term collaborations with exchange of ideas and, and development in both directions. And this is, this is really critical. Um, and finally, alignment of projects with core lab strengths. The, uh, the program, it really got off to a fantastic start. Uh, the first couple of years, everything seemed to be going really well. And then there was a very difficult period, a couple of years, a few, two or three or four years in, where it seemed like a lot of things just weren't working. Uh, it's, it's in, and it, there were a lot of things that seemed like they would have worked just fine, but for whatever reason, the implementation was very difficult. And part of the, uh, the, what came out of that period was sort of reevaluating how the project should mesh with our lab's core strengths. For example, at the time, we were trying to do some work with things like uh, more efficient cooking stoves, uh, some programs involving uh, nutritional education, and so on. And uh, those are all very important and very valid things to work on, uh, but they just weren't aligning very well with our core lab strengths, and we found that we did a lot better when we kind of went back to our basic uh, strengths in bioengineering, optical Im imaging, and uh, microfabrication and so on. One of the initial uh, projects that really kind of took off was this lab in a backpack. As you can imagine, this is one of the easier things to, to kind of implement. And so uh, a lot of these, this is a big pile of them that were distributed in Ecuador and they were uh, distributed to various parts of the country and flown around by small plane and so on. Uh, and uh, this shows some of these uh, same lab in a backpack here uh, being distributed by ox cart in Myanmar and in by bicycle in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the syringe clips that I described earlier uh, are another student design technology that has kind of taken off. 
uh, so in uh, about three years ago, uh, some students uh, on an internship were in Swaziland and they uh, had these syringe clips and they were demonstrating them for people in the, in the hospitals there. And uh, they ended up presenting to uh, groups that included some government officials. And it turns out that the Ministry of Health uh, placed an order for like uh, something like 200,000 of these syringe clips. And so suddenly th we had to, uh, the program had to kind of scramble and figure out how to scale up something, which is something that th at that point was fairly new. And so this, r this shows the, uh, the students working with these boxes of the syringe clips, which have now been, uh, we, we've kind of developed a, a partnership with an industrial partner who is uh, involved in manufacturing these in large quantities, and USAID is involved in, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the purchase and distribution of these as well. Now, as I said, it's important for these exchanges to go uh, in two ways. We regularly host uh, people from our collaborating institutions, both faculty members or clinicians and students, for various events or, or uh, uh, exchanges that we have in Houston. And so this is an example from just last week. Uh, we had an undergraduate design competition at Rice. Uh, and one of the, so we had teams from Rice University and from around the United States, but we also had participation from uh, some faculty members uh, from Gemma University in Ethiopia. Uh, so these are two faculty members from Gemma University and interacting here with, with some of the students at the competition. And uh, this is Dr. Alimayahu who addressed the, gave one of the major addresses at the event. And these are uh, posters uh, that were uh, made by students at Gemma University. And they presented their posters remotely uh, by video conference as part of the competition. So they were participating in the competition. So we're, and we're hoping to, in the future, host students as well as faculty from Gemma University in Ethiopia. So we're, we're, we do events like this to try to make sure that the exchange goes in both directions. Now as my last uh, point on implementation, I'd just like to talk a little bit about uh, this CPAP system. So at the beginning uh, of the uh, lecture, I showed a slide uh, of a, an infant who was suffering from respiratory distress at a hospital in Malawi. And Respiratory distress can be treated by the use of continuous positive airway pressure systems. These are systems that basically provide a little bit of pressure uh, to prevent uh, total alveolar collapse between breaths so that it makes it just a little bit easier for the infant to take that next breath. And so uh, these systems are uh, too expensive for some low resource settings and but they're very important in reducing neonatal mortality. Uh, this represents the uh, uh, typical percentage survival uh, for neonates with respiratory distress if they're given no treatment or with just nasal oxygen or with CPAP or with CPAP plus, plus uh, the use of surfactant. So uh, Malawi, for example, is right here. Nasal oxygen is typically available, but uh, CPAP is typically not available. And so this developed as a student project. Uh, a CPAP system basically consists of a flow generator with, with pumps, a pressure regulator, and a patient interface. And the first student-designed uh, CPAP system of this type that came out of one of these bioengineering design courses was basically a little plastic Tupperware container with a couple of aquarium pumps and a little water bottle that the tube would be placed in. And it's now in about, you know, maybe the third generation or, or so down, and it's basically the same thing. A couple of little aquarium-style pumps inside of a, a housing and a b bottle here for pressure regulation. And so uh, this device was student-developed, uh, student-improved over the course of a couple of different uh, iterations. And the students went out and compared their device to the performance of a 
uh, commercial uh, CPAP device. And as you can see, the, it's kind of hard to tell any difference between these. These are the, the mean pressures here and the, the excursions in pressure. Uh, this is the reference CPAP device, and that's the, the student-built uh, one. Uh, but instead of a $6,000 device, it's uh, built for a materials cost of $350. And so this was uh, published by, uh, uh, by Jocelyn Brown and, and, and her co-authors. Jocelyn Brown was one of the students involved in developing the device. And so uh, this device has been implemented initially in uh, Malawi. And so this shows some data from a couple of uh, infants who were treated using the CPAP, the, the student-designed student CPAP devices. Uh, this first case is a six-month-old baby who uh, uh, came in with bronchiolitis and was unresponsive at the time that they came in. Uh, to the hospital. Uh, their oxygen saturation initially was around 50 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 60 percent. Uh, the heart rate was up around 170 and uh, within one, they were placed on the uh, on the low-cost low CPAP device uh, and within about one hour oxygen saturation was up to 98 percent. Heart rate came down uh, they were on the CPAP device for four days and then transitioned to nasal oxygen uh, and then on room air finally and discharged on day six uh, and did quite well. This next uh, case was uh, a, an infant, uh, a neonate, a full-term neonate who was in respiratory distress due to uh, congenital pneumonia and initially had an oxygen saturation at 50%, uh, high heart rate, and was placed on the low-cost CPAP device, and within four hours, uh, oxygen saturation improved uh, markedly, uh, heart rate eventually stabilized, and the, the, the infant was on the CPAP up through day three, transitioned to room air, and again, we had a, a fairly successful outcome uh, for that uh, patient as well. So the uh, this is kind of an interesting point for the RISE 360 program because this is a kind of a higher level of intervention uh, than we have really had before. And this is kind of directly, directly using student design devices to, to inter intervene and, sta and save lives. And again, we're working with an industrial partner who is now involved in, in manufacturing the devices that will actually be used in the scale up. And so uh, this is... Uh, the picture that I showed at the beginning, this is uh, the infant in uh, respiratory distress, and you can recognize now the, uh, the student-designed CPAP device over here that's being used to treat that, that uh, infant. Uh, this is Jocelyn, the student who uh, was heavily involved in the initial design of the system and uh, has spent a lot of time in Malawi and is now actually at this point is, is now a has graduated from Rice and has been living in Malawi for a couple of years now and is helping to coordinate this scale up. And in fact, uh, for this summer's internships, we have a number of students who are going to Malawi to participate in the scale up of the, uh, the BCPAP device. So uh, overall, it is, uh, it's quite remarkable and quite inspiring to see what some of these students can do whenever you turn them loose on some of these uh, global health problems. So uh, with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the people who, uh, in addition to uh, Dr. Cordum, who founded the program and is, in, in, uh, is basically the, the, the motivating force behind it, and, uh, and Lauren uh, Vestowick Gray, who is the current director of the program, and then these people here at Rice who are involved in some way with, the, uh, with this work and funding from HHMI and USAID. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks for the work and also for the talk. It's very interesting what you do there. Um, so you were talking about the sustainability of this program. Don't you think one important part of making it sustainable is to actually teach the local experts over there? Because those are the people who know the problem, they know their resources, and they can address those problems much better. 
Yes, uh, that's exactly right. Is that the the in many cases the solutions, uh, the long term solutions that are sustainable are going to come from uh, the the clinicians and the, the 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 students and the people who are who are in that setting, and and I th I think that that that's pretty well recognized by people who have been working in this that that you can't really develop a sustainable solution by by importing people and 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 uh, having them uh, be in that in that in, in that particular country for a certain period of time and then and then leave you have to have some sort of training component and in fact we have collaborations going on I, I mentioned Ethiopia we have collaborations going on right now uh, with uh, biomedical technicians uh, and collaborations involving training people uh, in Ethiopia who are involved in working on medical equipment so that they will be able to repair that equipment whenever it's necessary to do so. Hi. I, I just would like to know how does it work in terms of cultural and political environments going the program to those places? Yes, that's that's always a consideration, and it's different in every in every country. Uh, certainly, in every situation, uh, just as you would have uh, in 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 our own country, if you're doing any sort of uh, human subjects uh, research, you're going to have to go through you know, the review boards and get get the appropriate approvals or uh, the FDA or whatever. And similarly, whenever we work in uh, countries in, in Africa or wherever, uh, we have to go through the appropriate governmental uh, bodies to get the approval at the, either at the hospital level or the governmental level and so on. And so the, you know, the, the level of cooperation and interest can vary and so that can certainly play a role in, uh, you know, there in, in where some of these internships and collaborations develop in other places where they may not develop as well because there's not a political environment and so on that will that will be conducive to it. So yes, so and and certainly the cultural uh, the cultural aspects as well. That is one of the reasons why, as I said, all of the concepts and d design problems need to come organically from the people who are working in that setting on a daily basis. We, we, can't, we can't come up with ideas that we think will work and take them to some setting and say, okay, now do this. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, it, the ideas have to come from people who are in that setting and know uh, the needs. Somewhat to build on that question, um, I've heard uh, a little bit of controversy over the use of um, new devices in underdeveloped countries because they don't have similar boards like the US has the FDA. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering a little bit about uh, the bioethics, but more specifically how you address the bioethics questions with your students. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, that's a, a great question. And so what we do is, and everything that we do goes through uh, our own institutional review board. And so in order for, uh, well, I guess first of all, I should say that one of the first things that any of the students do who are involved in this program is they go through the standard training in, uh, in bioethics and, and uh, the history of, of ethics in biomedical research and all those sorts of things. So they, they have that training, but then actually having that implemented in, in real experience is a different issue. But uh, all of the research is needs to be approved at uh, both Rice and at the collaborating institution. So if we don't have a, an appropriate collaborating institution that can provide an appropriate type of, uh, of approval for those studies, then it's probably not likely that we're going to be doing that work at all in that environment. And so it's just a matter of making sure that there are a lot of checks and balances in place that everybody knows what approvals are required and basically, that whatever we do uh, in in some in in whatever country we're working in, is this something that would be uh, acceptable to do in our own country? For example, it, you know, it's it's a it's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to. But but yes, that's certainly a an area that's that's uh, 
that is, if, if there are people who are not uh, attentive to the, the issues involved, it's certainly an area where, uh, where you, could, you could see some programs that could, could do some research that might be a little bit uh, on the borderline. So. First, I think that it's a very nice program for the undeveloping developed countries. But have you ever think about the risks? What if there is a medical risk, medical accident? Will somebody be responsible for the accident? Responsibility, liability, mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's going to uh, that's going to come back to uh, the way that the protocol is set up and the all the collaborating institutions and so on. But it's something that. Certainly, that the uh, that the rice review boards take very seriously, and that they're going to look very carefully at anything that is going to involve liability. And you you notice that uh, by the time we get to uh, in the cases where we're doing actual scale up of any type of technology, at the, at that point we're uh, tending to work with industrial partners who are involved in building the devices. So we're not we're not trying to scale up with things that have been assembled by teams of students and so on. So yes, uh, liability is uh, certainly something that... Is it true that it takes longer if you want to use it in the American hospitals? I, I'm sorry? Yeah. Is it true that it takes longer before you really apply this I instrument to your American hospitals? Well, I think that varies. It depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, there are certainly cases where we have applied to do something at an American hospital at, at MD Anderson and waited a couple of years for the approval. So I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I would say that uh, I would say that it's, it's quite variable. There, there, are, there are some cases where we have rapidly gotten approval to do some things in, in hospitals and different countries and there are some cases where uh, it has taken a lot of time and a lot of effort to get those approvals. So it, it's quite variable. Thank you. What, um, what opportunities do you have for collaboration with, um, for example, the conference attendees, those of us that come from more developed countries rather than the underdeveloped mm -hmm. countries that you're targeting? So uh, one thing that I would suggest is, uh, I, I mentioned the undergraduate uh, design competition, and that was, for, that was for undergraduate teams, but we have similar events uh, in which there's some sort of uh, conference or, or competition uh, held at Rice or some other institution where people can uh, bring their own, their own designs and, and uh, their own ideas. Um, and then, uh, there may be just opportunities for people who are really interested just to uh, email us and let us know you're interested and, and you know, see, what, see what mutual interest we have to, uh, to talk about a collaboration. I and mean, there's, there's a lot going on, as you saw, a lot of people working in a lot of different areas, and so there may be some opportunities for people to, to get involved in some way with that. Let's thank you. Thank again. you. Thank you, Professor.